Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Bacon Plus. This is the first talk in the fall, yes, the first Bacon Plus meeting in the fall. So we have two speakers as usual. First one's gonna be Frederick Paiskens from the England's Group. He's gonna tell us about optimizing single photon generation for integrated cavity emitter systems. Okay. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, so, as I said, I'm from the Engels Group, uh, and we are working on the integration of 2D materials on top of uh, silicon nitride photonic chips. Uh, so, my background is photonics, so when I arrived at MIT, uh, I had to catch up with a lot of quantum stuff, uh, and part of that was actually going into uh, more of the theory of how we can optimize uh, integrated uh, cavity emitter systems uh, and how we have to design them to improve on the quality of these devices. So I will mainly focus on the theory work that we have done uh, the last year. Um, and if time permits, in the end, I will just briefly go into some of the experiments we plan to do uh, in order to test uh, this theory. Uh, but the rationale is that, OK, uh, atomic and uh, Photonic quantum systems, they are central in a lot of areas for quantum information processing. But a central challenge is always uh, how can we improve the interaction between single photons and the single emitters. And a lot of theory work has been done uh, to approach this by either using dielectric uh, waveguides, dielectric cavities, plasmonic waveguides, and plasmonic cavities. Um, but last year, a review article in ACS Photonics by uh, Famous Kundrink actually pointed out that. It's still a challenge to uh, really find a model that describes how a nanoplasmonic cavity, uh, which is interacting with a single quantum emitter, and that in itself is interacting with a waveguide, how we can actually describe that. Um, and in particular, there was a need, how can we actually calculate the single photon extraction efficiency and indistinguishability uh, of such a system? So if such a system emits a single photon, what is the efficiency by which it will actually couple into a guided waveguide mode. So we started from a uh, quantum optics model, which is basically uh, you have your emitter, which we describe as a two-level emitter, uh, which in itself is coupled to a cavity, and that cavity is coupled to a waveguide system. And it is described by this Hamiltonian, so where you have the terms describing the emitter, describing the cavity, describing the coupling between the emitter and the cavity. And then these terms, they all incorporate actually your left and your right traveling waves uh, in a waveguide system. So how can, we that, how can we describe that? There's a paper by uh, Derek Chang, who is uh, one of our collaborators uh, in, in this work, uh, where they actually pointed out that the operators for the waveguides mode, which uh, pop up in this Hamiltonian, they can be integrated out, and they can be incorporated as an extra Lindblad term in your master equation approach. So basically, the kappa term over here. Uh, so that is, I'll show on the next slide the master equation, uh, which pops up. Um, so uh, that will pop up as an extra loss term, which is described by this kappa. Uh, and if we rotate it to a specific driving frequency, we end up with a Hamiltonian, which is basically describing uh, your atomic um, Hamiltonian, your cavity Hamiltonian, and the coupling with it. So this is the basic Hamiltonian, and then the loss terms, uh, which will be your Lindblad terms, will be, on one hand, we have uh, our cavity, which has a certain quality factor. Uh, so this cavity can be either a plasmonic nanoparticle, but uh, you might as well take this as a dielectric cavity, such as a ring resonator, uh, or a microtoroid. 
um, which has certain radiative losses and has certain absorption losses. Um, and the master equation then, which describes the evolution of the density uh, matrix uh, of that system, um, contains the commutator of uh, that Hamiltonian I showed on the first uh, slide, and then together with some Lindlap terms. Um, and the first one uh, is your overall cavity decay rate, so that contains both uh, the intrinsic decay rate of the cavity, uh, which is just uh, described by your unloaded Q factor, and then that additional term, which pops up as a result of the uh, waveguides mode you have, so which describes the coupling between the cavity uh, and the waveguide, so the single mode waveguide. Then the second term uh, describes the decay rate of the emitter, uh, and the third term is a dephasing term, uh, which just uh, tells you how the off diagonal matrix elements uh, will evolve. So this has been studied a lot for dielectric systems. Uh, what we did in particular is uh, we studied uh, the case when this cavity emitter system would be uh, a nanoplasmonic uh, cavity coupled to an emitter. And the reason for that is uh, that when I joined Dirk's group, uh, I had designed these kind of structures for surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy on chip. Uh, so where we had bow tie antennas coupled to a molecule and then in itself we uh, extracted the uh, Raman signal from the waveguide. So the idea was what if we put a quantum emitter near such a bow tie antenna, uh, what is actually the efficiency and the indistinguishability of the photons that we get out of this chip? Um, and as I will show in a few slides, uh, the main difference for a plasmonic system will be in the decay rate of the emitter. But to come to that, I'll briefly go into, uh, and probably a lot of you guys know this already, so I'll be quick on this. Uh, so if you consider a nanoplasmonic particle, it will typically be much smaller than the wavelength of light. So one can use an electrostatic uh, approximation to calculate the electric fields which uh, arise near the surface of such a particle. So it basically uh, boils down to a Laplace equation where you can calculate the electric fields uh, inside and outside of the particle. Um, and you have well, first order modes and higher order modes. So the L over here is just describing the mode number uh, of the electromagnetic mode that is supported by such a plasmonic particle. And physically, one can interpret this L is one is a dipole mode where you just have plus charges and minus charges sitting on opposite sides of the particle. The higher order modes, they will have different distributions of your charge in the plasmonic nanoparticle. So basically one can have quadrupolar modes which would have plus, minus, minus, plus, and so forth. So that is the physical reasoning behind uh, the modes in such a plasmonic particle. Uh, and one can calculate the resonance frequency for each of these modes. Uh, and using the modal expansion of that electric field, one can calculate the charge distribution. So that is typically how the plasmonic community will characterize uh, modes in such a system. Um, using the charge density, one can calculate the dipole moment associated to each of these modes. And it turns out that if you just assume a, a plane wave excitation for such a particle and you calculate it, then it turns out that only the fundamental dipole mode, so L equals one, is optically active. All the other modes, they have a vanishing uh, dipole moment. So if we break it down, what happens is the fundamental dipole mode will be the one that will be mostly coupling to your uh, system in an optical way, so which will be the useful one, while all the higher order modes in a plasmonic system will usually or mostly decay through a non-radiative part. So if we excite initially our plasmonic nanoparticle, then we will have a certain radiative loss, a certain uh, absorption loss. Part is coupling, so the L is one mode, the fundament fundamental one is coupling with your um, molecule or quantum emitter. And then only the one that is coupled actually to your fundamental mode will uh, be useful for fluorescence purposes. So that is the useful emission which you want to extract. All the other uh, modes, they will only contribute to what is called plasmonic quenching. And that is exactly what we want to incorporate in our model to see what is the ultimate efficiency we can get. So if you start from a general electromagnetic formula of the decay rate of a quantum emitter, uh, which can be calculated using a Green's tensor matter, method, uh, then it breaks down basically uh, in three contributions. You would have your emission to free space, the cavity-mediated radiation, the 
and then the non-radiative part. And for a plasmonic uh, nanoparticle, this is a pretty important part because basically you have a lot of these uh, modes. You have an infinite number of uh, modes. This is for a, a spherical nanoparticle. The reason why we did this is because there's just analytical formulas available for this. For another type of plasmonic particle, for example, both high antennas or dot antennas, you would have to calculate it numerically with uh, FDDD solver. And it turns out if you go through uh, the numerics, then you can actually write uh, the decay rate of the quantum emitter, which I showed uh, on one of the first slides, which pops up in this master equation, uh, actually contains a large contribution uh, of this uh, plasmonic quenching. So the quenching factor basically is an infinite sum over all these higher order plasmonic modes, which will basically quench the radiation. And importantly, uh, the coupling rate by which your quantum emitter couples uh, to the cavity, so the one that is uh, the useful one, also pops up in this decay rate. So the higher the coupling uh, with your useful mode, also the higher your quenching in to uh, the higher order modes will become. So we do expect a certain interplay between the two, uh, and we do expect we can optimize it for certain values. <coughs> so, um, and yeah, the coupling rate itself, um, so that is the typical coupling constant which you would find in most quantum uh, optics papers. Uh, it has just a dependency on the modal volume of the cavity, which is shown over <coughs> here. So it's inversely proportional to the modal volume. So that is the first part. The second part is that plasmonic cavity in itself couples to the waveguide modes. Uh, and as said, the dipole mode is the main one, uh, which is optically active. So if we take the charge distribution of our dipole mode uh, and we calculate the associated dipole moment or the interaction with uh, the waveguide mode, one can write it down um, as uh, plasmon polarizability. <coughs> so this is basically what will be used to calculate the coupling between the plasmonic nanoparticle and the waveguide mode, uh, which is, well, as, as most of you know, uh, the interaction between a dipole and an electric field is just given by the dot product of <coughs> your dipole moment and the electric uh, field of the waveguide. So this is uh, your waveguide mode. For a single mode waveguide, it will typically be a TE mode. And one can show, uh, again, after uh, some calculation, that the, the coupling constant, uh, so that decay rate which pops up in our master equation, um, has this functional form. If we calculate it further, it depends on the effective modal area of the waveguide. Uh, and this factor is just incorporating uh, the overlap between your waveguide and your cavity mode. Um, so it's a factor between 0 and 1. Um, and eventually, one pop, uh, comes up with a formula that the coupling rate in itself is proportional to your modal volume and is inversely proportional to the effective modal area of the waveguide. So now we have all the formulas that we need uh, to actually do our master equation uh, approach and calculate the efficiency um, of single photon generation and indistinguishability. Um, and we start from uh, a quantum state where Initially, our emitter is excited uh, to its excited state, and then we just look at the decay of that system to the ground state, uh, which is described by these, this set of equations. And all the parameters that we have over here uh, are the ones that, are, uh, that we calculated as a function of modal volume and effective modal area of the waveguide. And it turns out that for a plasmonic system, um, the single photon extraction, which is just uh, the probability here that your system is in the excited state integrated over time, times the decay rate of that emitter, is given uh, by the following formula. So now we want to investigate as a function of the parameters which pop up over here, uh, how we can actually optimize it, uh, and how good or how bad a plasmonic system is. Because a lot of experimental papers that um, showed up in the last years, uh, they focus on plasmonics is useful uh, for doing stuff at room temperature because uh, the coupling between an emitter and a plasmonic cavity can usually be very high because uh, plasmonic cavities have a very small modal volume. So people argue that's why they are useful. So we study the system at room temperature and look at what is the efficiency by which you can extract single photons at room temperature. Um, and the plots over here, 
so basically the first plot uh, is showing this single photon extraction as a function of uh, the distance between uh, the emitter and the cavity and as a function of the radius of uh, the spherical nanopore. <laughs> And in, in more general cases, uh, so this radius, uh, you would have to, this axis is actually your modal volume. And for a spherical particle, the modal volume is simply proportional to the volume of that spherical particle. Uh, and this uh, plot over here is all on a logarithmic scale. Um, so zero would correspond to a near unity uh, extraction efficiency. Then the plot over here shows uh, the decay rate uh, of your emitter. Uh, so which also depends uh, on the distance and the modal volume because of the fact that you have this quenching factor over there, this infinite sum over higher order plasma modes. Uh, and then the two bottom figures, uh, they actually tell you something about how good or how bad the cavity uh, is. Um, so uh, in this regime, we have a, a bad cavity. This is a good cavity regime. Uh, and the last one is uh, showing uh, in which regime we are, so whether we are in a strong coupling regime or in a weak uh, coupling re regime, which is standard terminology found in a lot of quantum optics papers. And if you look um, near resonance, that quenching factor can be uh, expressed as some analytic function. So again, we can have some nice analytic formulas for that. Uh, and there are basically two regimes. Uh, the first one where the emitter is sitting quite far away from the surface of the plasmonic nanoparticle, then you will be limited by just the intrinsic decay rate. However, if your emitter gets closer and closer to your plasmonic nanoparticle, this quenching into all higher order modes starts to kick in, and we are limited uh, by the quenching factor over here. And it turns out that the optimum, so the red dot over here, is the position where we find a maximum single photon extraction. So basically the highest probability that we will get a single photon coming out of the waveguide uh, is in the crossover region between these two. Uh, so for a dielectric cavity, you would like to have your particle as close as possible to the maximum electric field. Although here, the maximum electric field for a plasmonic particle is just near its surface, but if an emitter is sitting really on the surface of a plasmonic nanoparticle, this quenching term will be huge. So we will have <coughs> huge losses uh, that are funneled into the non-radiative modes, which are useful. <coughs> so the, the result is that the optimum modal volume, uh, which is from a photonics, uh, coming from a photonics community, people will generally try to uh, see what is the modal volume I can reach with cavities. And in a lot of papers, you <coughs> see stress on we want to have an as small as possible modal volume uh, to get better results. Although here, actually, we see we don't need to push this uh, to an extremely small value. But actually, the optimum for this particular kind of system uh, depends on the Q factor and on the effective index of your, your waveguide mode. Uh, so that is one of the, was one of the key results. Uh, and so the maximum photon extraction is uh, obtained in the weak coupling regime, not in the strong coupling regime. However, then there's the second part, the indistinguishability of the single photons coming out uh, is actually optimized for uh, a different <coughs> modal volume. Uh, so there are conflicting yeah. requirements. And the plot over here shows, uh, as a function of the distance of the emitter, um, your single photon extraction. The blue line is the indistinguishability. So. In nearly all the cases where you have a decent single photon extraction out of the waveguide, the indistinguishability will be really low. However, you can actually get indistinguishabilities which are near unity, even with a plasmonic system, which is very lossy. But then the point comes that the odds that you see one of these photons coming out is near to zero. So you basically have no photons coming out of the system. Um, and in the bad cavity limit, where most of our system experimentally will be, it turns out that the requirement um, on the modal volume to actually have a high indistinguishability um, is shown by this formula over here. Uh, so this is our optimum modal volume for single photon extraction. And then this term over here, this is the most important one, uh, because again, we're focusing on room temperature systems, because that's where a lot of people claim that plasmonics could be useful. But at room temperature, the dephasing rate is, is huge, can be in the order of terahertz. So the modal volume that you require for 
a high-end distinguishability is actually much, much smaller than the one you would need for an optimum photon extraction. So there's always an, an interplay between uh, the two. So you can never get the best of both worlds, at least for uh, spherical nanoparticle, which is an idealized system already. Uh, so you can get high extraction efficiency or high indistinguishability, but in order to optimize the two, then basically it would mean that you have to make this factor closer to one, so the modal volumes uh, to optimize each of the two uh, are closer to each other. But basically getting this uh, factor closer to one means that your dephasing rate has uh, to become smaller, which means you would have to go to lower temperatures. So in which case, you might as well go to a dielectric system. So the actual figure of merit uh, that you want to optimize is not one of the two, but just the product of the two. And there you would see that for realistic plasmonic systems, uh, so which, which have typical Q factors of about 15 for visible frequencies, uh, it becomes nearly impossible to get an, a near unity uh, uh, efficiency times uh, indistinguishability um, product. Just like as a thought exercise, this is for a spherical nanoparticle. So people have uh, studied a lot of plasmonic cavities where you, for example, can think of bringing two uh, plasmonic particles close to each other and in the, in the gap region between these two particles, you will have an increased field enhancement. Your polarizability of the system will also be higher. All these things, they help in boosting the uh, efficiency for the product of the two. Uh, so the plot over here is just a hypothetical one where if we would have a field enhancement, so this one we think of bringing two plasmonic nanoparticles close to each other and putting a quantum emitter in the gap between the two, okay, that will boost your efficiency. Uh, increased polarizability basically is uh, the intention of the system to be uh, coupled to outside radiation. So basically, if we have a raw antenna, which is aligned along the polarization of your light, it will have an increased polarizability <coughs> for that specific light source. So both can improve it, but you never can get these very good values, which a lot of people try to claim, okay, for room temperature, we can really do something useful with it. Yes, it's true, you can either get a decent efficiency, but then you will get a really low indistinguishability, or you can get a high indistinguishability, but then the odds of seeing a photon ever coming out of that waveguide <coughs> is extremely low. Uh, so the bottom line that I want to, uh, or that we want to conclude from this, uh, is that, okay, now we at least, uh, we have an analytical model which uh, describes the impact of quenching and dephasing, uh, and really we have a, a nice analytical formalism now yeah. to calculate the performance for different nanoplasmonic systems which are on a waveguide. However, uh, does it allow really efficient room temperature? Single photon sources, no, because even for the best systems, your efficiency will be, let's say, close to 60 or 70 percent. The plot that I've showed with the field enhancement, that is idealized. I mean, to get that in an experimental system would be close to impossible. Does it allow to get efficient low temperature photon sources? Maybe, but then again, we have to reduce the dephasing factor. And as I showed already, it is not necessary to get the smallest possible mode volumes for which these plasmonic cavities are very good. But if you anyway don't need an extremely small vo mode volume, you might as well switch to dielectric cavities which have, well, not this issue of quenching, so which is the funneling of fluorescence into higher order uh, plasma modes. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, this is one thing we have uh, published a few months ago, and then we did a, a separate study, which I have not addressed, uh, on actually how you can uh, change the non-classicality of light beam. So if you have a coherent light beam, like a laser beam traveling in a waveguide, how we can influence the photon statistics of that waveguide uh, by using a plasmonic system. And a similar exercise uh, pops up, so there is an optimum <coughs> in order to um, minimize your second order correlation function. Uh, so I didn't show it here, I'd rather uh, maybe briefly say what the idea is now uh, for our uh, experiments to do, so uh, I've mainly focused on the theory now. Um, but the idea is, well, our first idea was use the chips that I already had with plasmonics, which we will not do. Uh, we will use uh, dielectric cavities and integrate them with 2D material. So a quantum emitter would be an, an emitter in a 2D material and integrate them on top of an existing silicon nitride photonic chip. Why silicon nitride? Because silicon nitride is low loss 
for the visible. So a lot of these 2D emitters, uh, they uh, emit light in the visible regime. Uh, so we can guide them with low loss, uh, and we can make ring resonator cavities with them or TBR uh, filters on a chip. So we can actually have both enhancement of our quantum uh, of our fluorescence, uh, and then an on-chip filtering. So get rid of the, the excitation light uh, on the chip, uh, and that is what we're going on, which is also uh, in collaboration with with Pavel's group. So uh, we're we're now uh, in the first stage of trying to put some of these ideas into uh, practicality. So we, we got our first chips uh, now. And hopefully, we'll, the first thing would be is coupling the radiation from a single <coughs> photon emitter to the waveguide mode. The second thing would be, OK, can we indeed show there is this optimum modal volume? And Because that would be useful for a photonics community. Then basically, we design a photonic chip, which can be made mass reproducible, and we transfer 2D materials on top of them which is fabrication-wise, uh, I think, a lot easier than, for example, diamond fabrication, which is very tricky uh, to do in a photonics platform. So that is one of the directions we're, uh, we're thinking of uh, doing. But due to lack of time, I focused on the theory work and just briefly uh, wanted to state what we were planning to do. So um, that more or less concludes my presentation. And if there are any questions, shoot. You mean spectrally? Yeah. Or, uh, well, another advantage of the plasmonic, because they have a very low Q factor, their resonance is really broad. So even if you would not be perfectly aligned resonantly with your emitter, you would still be close to resonance because the, the typical width of a plasmonic resonance at around six or 700 nanometers is still 100 nanometers. So even if there's a small uh, spectral shift and your emitter is not exactly at a specific wavelength, the enhancement, so the, the omega factors which would pop up in the formula, would not, it would not be an order of magnitude difference for, so, for these. So, like, uh, with diamond and room capture, you always win almost, right? Because the NVs are, like, almost not overlapping, so it's not wanting to cavity, you will always have some out there overlap. Yeah, you have spectral overlap, but the, the tricky thing is, so the one of the factors that I've showed is the, the, the emitter has to be close to the surface, and with close, I mean, three nanometer, but not one nanometer, and also not five nanometer. One nanometer, you will quench almost all the radiation. Five nanometer, you will lose a lot of the plasmonics effects. And typically, what people then do is uh, there is some surface chemistry, specifically for gold, where you can have a tile chemistry, where they basically they have a shell around your plasmonic particle. So it inhibits a quantum emitter to come too close, but yet you have it at a distance just determined by the, the chemical bond. But fabrication-wise, that is very tricky. So that's why we wanted to make the, the exercise first, what is actually the best we can get. But in this, even the best possible scenario, fabrication-wise, it is very, very difficult to achieve to get. Like, for example, if we would just have a, a normal waveguide system where, OK, the enhancement will be lowered, but the evanescent <coughs> field where you can actually have still some useful light spreads over 100 to 150 nanometers. So if our emitter is not exact on the surface, we, we will still have some effect there. While for plasmonics, it almost vanishes if you're further away than 20 nanometers from, uh, from the surface. So, Are there any other questions? No? No, that's time for Nick again. Sorry. We just disconnected there. But yeah. Should we? Okay. 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 So now we're going to close his, right? <clears throat> and we're going to go to yours. And then yep. we're going to go from there. Yep. Let's display. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next talk is by 
Pranitana, who's going to tell us about sign reversible, sign reversible call effect in two layer visco. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. So, um, I'm Frank Jow from Philip Kim Group down the street from here. So what we're trying to do in the last couple of years is actually try to introduce, try to um, expand the library of Vanderbilt's materials that we have to include the uh, high temperature cuprate superconductors. So in particular, these are some of arguably some of the more in, some of the most interesting materials available to condensed matter physics because uh, you have a superconductivity which depends on exactly which member of the family you're working with, uh, which is high enough so that you can access it using liquid nitrogen temperatures. Now, in addition to the superconducting state, you also have access to a wide variety of different electronic states if you can simply tune the carrier density in the same material. So what we want to achieve, so structurally, um, these materials, what these materials all have in common is that they all have these copper oxide planes, which we believe are conducting, separated by these insulating layers. And, the, and these insulating layers, there's many different choices of these guys. Depending on which you use, you can actually get a wide variety of these different materials, and that will change the details of basically what this phase diagram looks like. But generally, the phase diagrams basically all look very similar between these guys. And actually, in the cuprates, we're very lucky to have access to this material, which is actually um, what makes it special, is that it has these neighboring business oxide layers which are Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt bonded to one another. So basically, in your whole unit cell over here, um, you can split the, uh, the crystal in the C direction and make these really wonderful, large, exfoliable flakes. But just because we can do it doesn't mean we should. And we have to think about exactly what is it that we can bring to the table as basically like Vanderbilt's graphene guys compared to you know, 30 years of the smartest people looking at these kind of materials. And in my opinion, there's actually quite a few things that we can do. So by, by using mechanical <laughs> exfoliation, naturally we can have access to crystals which are extremely thin. So over here, what I'm showing you is a 1.5 unit cell uh, crystal covered by a thin piece of hexagonal boron nitride. So that's just to protect the sample from air while we load it into the cryostat. And we can actually recover a superconducting transition at the bulk-like temperature in these crystals. Now. At the same time, because you, you have very um, thin crystals, you can also very gently etch them into the shape that you want using argon ion uh, milling. Uh, and also, because we have crystals where we have isolated the surface and eliminated the, the bulk, we can actually control the uh, carrier density using a simple trick from semiconductor physics. Um, so here, what I'm showing is a 1.5 unit cell device under doped to about 20K uh, superconducting temperature and we actually see zero resistance, and we can tune this uh, transition temperature a little bit by using nothing but a silicon backgate. Now, if we were to do a little bit better, and instead of using 1.5 unit cell, you go to, say, 0.5 unit cell, and you use a slightly better gate, such as a um, hexagonal boron nitride top gate, you can actually do a lot better. So that's something that we're working on. But to be honest, if um, these, actually these things are all advantages that you have access to, by using epitaxial thin film growths. So things like molecular beam epitaxy or uh, PRD. So because they can grow these thin films and etch them into the shapes that you want and control the doping density, and actually there has been 30 years worth of really wonderful results using these techniques. But the key advantage I think that we bring to the table as Wall's guys is that we have the freedom to choose whatever substrates we please. So uh, in thin film growths, of course, you have to match the lattice parameter of the flakes that you're growing with the lattice of the substrate. And you have to, and um, whereas here, we don't really care. We can put it wherever we please. And so what I'm showing you here is a very thin crystal suspended on a silicon nitride membrane with these holes cut into them so that we can do electron diffraction in these holes. And what you see here is very well defined um, diffraction, um, uh, diffraction peaks which indicates that we have high crystalline order in our crystals, even though they're extremely thin. And the other key advantage that we have is we have the advantage to make heterostructures. So as um, Pablo's group so ably showed recently, uh, if you just you know, <clears throat> twist your graphene by a little bit, you can have access to emergent uh, electronic states, which are not present in the, um, the parent compound, in, in this case, graphene. But in our case, we're not nowhere near that. But what we can do, however, is we can actually 
rip this flake, uh, this, this large flake, into two separate pieces. You can see the outlines here are actually the same. And we can actually put them on top of each other. And if you do this quickly enough and cleanly enough, you can actually realize an interface um, with, where the, um, which is intimate enough such that the first layer next to the interface still retains the crystallinity of the bulk. And actually, this, um, this interface is able to support <coughs> zero resistance, so a Josephson current in between the two crystals. Yes? That picture, there's some like, modulation. Exactly. Picture, right. So if, you're, um, if you look back on this, on this crystal structure, you see all these different layers. The brightest spots are these bismuth oxide layers, because these bismuth oxides are the heaviest element. And because each layer has a slightly different strain, so the crystal sort of pulls on itself. So that's why you get this extremely intricate and very interesting sort of um, uh, ordering in, this, in the lattice. How many cobalt oxide things? What, why do you use Right, so, why, so these are the copper oxide planes that you see here. Um, so this is one full unit cell. So basically, these two are related um, by a translation plus a. So, so my unit cell is four planes. Right, one unit cell has four planes in our material. There's another of, version of BISCO available, it's one plane per yeah. half unit cell, so, so two planes. So one plane by would have to be three oxide. Uh, in, this, in this case, it would be six. <coughs> uh, yeah, right. yeah, six. Why do you want to Right. So is that also there in the bulk crystal? Yes, yes. This is, uh, this is something in the bulk, right? So oh, you're saying yeah. that the bulk is. Like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is actually a ball crystal, so it keeps going. And um, so basically, yeah. <coughs> but we also see it in the very thin crystals. OK. So the reason that you haven't heard more about this system over the years is that actually these materials are extremely sensitive. So in terms of chemical reactivity, way back in the early 90s in our pads, the, uh, it was known that if you just expose these crystals to air for even one minute, you'll pick, pick up these extra peaks in the spectra. So what this is telling you is that as soon as you exfoliate these things in air, uh, you're going to get a chemical reaction on the surface, which renders these crystals insulating. So here they have an IR spectroscopy experiment on uh, very thin crystals. So the upshot is that we have to do all of that in our environment, and we have to eliminate all the resists and solvents that we use. Basically, if you, as soon as you start developing your PMMA, uh, your sample just dies in the developer solution. So these standard lithography techniques just won't work. But so far, all is not lost. Um, for example, Pablo's group handles a lot of air-free, air-sensitive materials. Mm -hmm. And there, the standard technique is to build a van der Waals stack and simply put the whole stack on top of contacts so that your contacts touches a device that you're measuring. But the outer layers of your heterostructure are chemically inert. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for us. Um, it turns out these crystals are highly heat sensitive. So what I'm showing you here is a 0.5 unit cell crystal. You can barely see it relative to the background, covered by a BN plate. And what we see is that we're probing two-point resistance inside the glove box. And even at room temperature, the resistance has increased by about 10% in about an hour or two. So, with this, so in fact, the standard recipe for changing the doping in these crystals is just to put it in an oven and bake it a little bit. And these are bulk crystals. In the limit of single layers, uh, they degrade very rapidly. So now, if you want to try to use standard uh, Van der Waals crystal pickup techniques, these techniques revolve around controlling the stickiness of some polymer using temperature. And at the last step, you have to basically melt your polymer. And as soon as you do that, your crystal dies. So we have to basically reinvent all of the techniques uh, in Van der Waals uh, chemical uh, <clears throat> fabrication. So what we did is, first of all, we built this um, glove box filled with all the things that we can do in the lab. So here's a transfer station. Here's a microscope. There's an IFM in there somewhere. And there's a fridge for uh, storing our samples. So, but the problem is we can't do lithography. So instead, we do the lithography on a separate chip. So here we have a silicon nitride chip with a suspended membrane. So it's transparent, as the previous speaker said. Um, so we can see through it. So with the guidance of a microscope, we can align it to our um, crystal evaporate it or, and glue it to the substrate using some vacuum grease. So it's a very simple trick. And then after evaporating our leads, we can just put the um, boron nitride right on top. And that seals the sample. For thicker samples, that's enough. And, um, and we have a working device. 
So what the whole stack looks like is this guy. This is a substrate. That's the uh, silicon nitride membrane. And we can basically evaporate it in our attached um, evaporator in the back of our glove box right there. And by the way, we can also do argon ion milling in this box. So there's quite a few things that we can do here. But anyway, so just to give a shout out to this technique, we can manufacture things on order of about 200 nanometers in resolution using a focus ion beam to make the mask. And we can align it to roughly one uh, micron accuracy to any, flake or, uh, any um, flat substrate. So and during the whole process, we don't keep anything except maybe during evaporation, and we don't do any uh, chemical exposure at all. So using this trick, we, we can basically control the device thickness, and also we can have some rudimentary control over the device geometry. And already there, we can have do a little bit of physics. So what I'm showing you here is a series of hull bars manufactured at different thicknesses. And um, what you see is that above um, the superconducting transition temperature, you have a linear resistance increase with temperature, which is exactly what you would expect, uh, followed by a transition at the bulk temperature. Now, for 1.5 unit cells, this is slightly older data. So actually, what we used to see is that the transition temperature is reduced because the crystals have become underdosed. And then, but over here, you actually have zero resistance. So um, now, if we get rid of the 1.5 unit cell and we look at the others and we normalize them by their thickness, what you see is that all the all the curves line up exactly on the same line, which means that we have preserved the quality of these samples, even though they're made on different days uh, with the same crystal. Now, once you get to 2.5 and 2 unit cells, the sort of the degradation in the interface starts to kick in. And you have slightly increased mobility in these samples, or decreased mobility, sorry. And also, if you just notice, the three unit cell sample has a slightly higher transition temperature. And if you just measure the normal state Hall effect up far above the superconducting transition temperature, you'll see that, well, OK, we see that it's a little bit more doped than the other system. So everything checks out. Fine. So well, what happens when we start cooling these things uh, down to TC? Well. So here's the data far above TC, which is linear in magnetic field, which is exactly what you would expect. At 90K, however, you start to pick up a little bit of a nonlinearity in the RXY data. And then if you cool the sample further, you see that this nonlinearity starts to become a little bit bigger until it reaches a maximum of about 77K. And then below that, it sort of starts to uh, disappear altogether. And by the time you get to about 60K or so, the effect uh, completely goes away. So there's so if you plot this in a phase diagram, you, basically this area of negative Hall resistance shows up as a stone region, and um, and as you cool the sample, the sine of the Hall effect reverses sine once and once again at low temperature. If we compare the samples of different thicknesses, we can basically draw the line at which R X Y equals zero. This is actually a fit. We'll get to that in a moment. And we can compare the data from the different samples. And we see that for some weird reason, the thinner sample have a larger one of these stones than the, than the thickest sample. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out this is a well-known effect in the coupe rays. So uh, in fact, it's universal to all the coupe rays, not only holdos like our system, but also electron dope in this guy. And moreover, in the holdope system, it turns out even though there's different um, types of cuprates in the hold dope area. It turns out this, the appearance of this Hall anomaly, this Hall sign reversal, is universal for all the optimally doped crystals as well as the underdoped ones. For some reason, if you go to the overdoped region, the effect goes away. Now, it's not unique to the cuprates. It's also seen in other things like uh, thin niobium nitride uh, superconducting films. But the difference here is that um, mm. the effect is seen slightly above the superconducting transition temperature. And in this case, this, uh, this TC is defined very precisely by the theory of superconducting fluctuations. This is a theory that above TC, um, your cool pairs are not energetically favorable. But nevertheless, you can have thermal fluctuations, which produce short-lived ones of, of these cool pairs. And the idea is that there's some theories about how um, these short-lived cool pairs gives you this sign switching. On the other hand, in the cuprates, this effect always occurs below TC. And uh, here, the theory always revolves around vortex physics. 
And actually, there's many theories being um, presented, and theoretical agreement has not yet been established. So one of the key problems in this, in, in this is then that people, um, we, we sort of, <clears throat> sorry, we lack quantitative comparisons between theory and experiment. So this is where our samples come in. So in the case of our sample, because our samples are very thin, we can apply the full machinery of uh, superconducting fluctuation theory to these systems. And so we can very accurately fit the um, zero uh, field um, resistance to determine the temperature at which Cooper pairs become energetically favorable. And next, we can basically fit our curves above and below that temperature with uh, the superconducting fluctuation theory as well as the one particular vortex theory. And we can see that um, <clears throat> when you're above, maybe about, <coughs> sorry, sorry, when you're um, away from the superconducting transition, <clears throat> sorry, when you're, <clears throat> when you're away from the superconducting transition, actually the fits work quite well. So, and moreover, if you just sort of fit the, uh, if you if we plot this data in temperature instead of field, you see that the two theories actually conf um, merge together quite well at TC. So what's going on? Let's focus on most of this uh, area of this space diagram, uh, where vortices dominate below TC. So standard series of vortex um, dynamics in a superconductor actually doesn't predict the sign switching. The necessary ingredient, turns out, is you have to add a, you have to add a term that allows you to have a different um, carrier density, total carrier density, inside the normal excitation of the vortex core compared to outside in the superconducting um, uh, condensate. So that's this guy over here. So if you do the if you push out the calculation that's explained in this paper here, you can actually calculate the relative contribution of due to this um, uh, different difference in carrier density, of course modulated by things like screening, um, to have some basically some magnitude proportional to this guy here. On the other hand, inside your superconductor core, you have normal excitations which can scatter with a superconducting. Um, with a superconducting supercurrent, transport current. So that's this term over here, roughly speaking. And in a two-fluid model, you also have the existence of these um, of a population of thermally excited uh, carriers from the condensate in, as quasi-particles. So this should give you some contribution that's very much like the normal state. So it's something that's linear in magnetic field. So this explains, roughly speaking, what's going on in this uh, phase diagram. As you start inside this phase, as you lower the temperature, what happens is that the, um, uh, the gap starts to open at low temperature. And so this term starts to dominate over this one. And you have, um, and so the sign reverses back to positive. Whereas in this direction, your field goes up. So this term linear in B dominates the 1 over B contribution, the vortex contribution. And you basically recover the normal state uh, value. On the other hand, if you increase the temperature, um, uh, superconductivity becomes energetically unfavorable, and you start to pick up superconducting fluctuations, which goes away at higher and higher temperature. So this result um, it appears in archive over here, so you can read up more about it over there. And um, the, most in, the most interesting part of this is that the, actually at the temperature at which um, the fluctuation theory believes is TC, we don't see a disappearance of this effect. It sort of continues to above TC. And what we think is going on, so, uh, and if you look on this equation, a necessary ingredient for vortex contributions to appear is that your gap must be non-zero at TC itself. So the fit actually, um, so one of the fitting parameters that we have, actually, I should say there's, uh, there's only, there's about, there's three fitting parameters below TC and only two in this regime, so it's quite accurate. Um, so it's quite a good model. Um, the superconduct, the, the, the gap size is actually um, non-zero at TC. And somehow this enhancement in the gap is greatest for samples which are thinner. So we think that this may be due to a superconducting fluctuation effect. Um, but anyway, so that's the result, that's the first result that we have um, understood uh, more or less. So 
So since I want to give you a preview for what we're working on now, one of which is I talked about that Van der Waals pickup techniques don't work. So right now, we're actually trying to make a low temperature pickup technique using a different polymer. And we can actually make these interfaces, which are completely clean and su supporting a uh, supercurrent. And by the way, this actually allows us to um, gives us hope that we can maybe one day synthesize a material which is half a unit cell in size, so that's this thick, um, because we can actually control the interface well enough so that the surface is actually not degraded. <laughs> so, so far, we've gotten two-point resistances around 5 kilo ohms or so inside the glove box, which is actually a reasonable number compared to the bulk value. And um, so, so the only thing missing is we couldn't quite get it into the cryostat because in the wire bonding process, the device dies. So the other thing that we're working on is a hard silicon nitride etch mass technique. This is actually adapted from a paper uh, from the Dirk, Dirk England group over here, where we can actually pick up a silicon nitride membrane with holes cut into it previously and align it directly on our flake, just as you would uh, pick up a Van der Waals crystal. And we can actually use this as a hard mass to uh, argon ion mill or crystal. And actually, we preserve the superconductivity uh, transition temperature, except this is, there's this weird artifact uh, below TC. So this is due to, um, in our experience, this is usually due to some air exposure. So you get the same thing, for example, if you bake the substrate for only about an hour instead of weeks, um, where you have some leftover absorbed water on the, on the substrate surface. So we think it's the same thing. So basically, we're working on that, working on all these new techniques. But I didn't do this alone. Um, my advisor, of course, um, without him, nothing would have been possible. Nicola was the cuprate expert in this, and also the um, X-ray diffraction expert. He uh, did all the TM pictures, and I, I've had a lot of help from our wonderful undergrads over at Harvard. And then meanwhile, uh, uh, Valerie and Svetlana did the superconducting theory fitting. Our crystals are from Brookhaven, like Anna Gu and Radan Jung. And our HBN, of course, are from Japan, from Dr. Tamaguchi Mashinabi. So thank you very much. Okay, questions? Yeah. I have two questions. So uh, the first one, uh, in the regime where you see the skinny of the sphere. Yeah. Uh, do you measure, I mean, have you looked at the temperature dependence of the tangent of the polarity? Uh, we have not. We have not. But we didn't see anything. Um, Special, too special there. Can you reproduce what's known from like all single which is already unusual? Uh, we didn't really look at that. Okay, the other question was if you uh, extrapolate your resistivity to like zero temperature, mm -hmm. uh, can you estimate what the free path is? And is that long, uh, longer than like the single crystals or is it shorter? Um, it's, it's, com it's about comparable. So basically, um, in, the, in the crystals, which are, I don't know how to change it. In the crystals, which are above five unit cells or so, the mobility seems to be constant. Um, that means the mobility is not very good, though. It's only about 20 or so at, low, at just above TC. And also, another indication of the quality of these crystals is whether or not, if you extrapolate this, this curve, whether or not it meets zero resistance. And it's um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, usually, it's not quite. So, it, yeah. The image that you have plane on top of plane? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, we'll start. Okay. Right, uh-huh. They are the same plane. They're the same plane. It's not folding, it's just that uh, you take half stack. Okay. That's correct. So basically, we have designed a uh, new transfer technique using, well, uh, using polymers, where uh, we can directly stick it the transfer polymer to our um, crystal. And then we can actually exfoliate it again um, using the stickiness of that polymer and put it down. You have a very strong polymer. Yes. It will pick up half of the crystal. Yes. The substrate is sitting outside. Right. So what's, what's interesting about this crystal, actually, is that it sticks very well to silicon oxide uh, substrates. But it doesn't stick so well between the ox uh, bismuth oxide planes. So actually, the usual trick with graphene is that you can always pick up your graphene right. with a hexagonal boron nitride. There's basically no exception. You can tear your graphene this way. 
But here, even if you use, so this BN doesn't work at all. It just doesn't stick at all. And um, if you use another BISCO, actually, it also doesn't work. So for some this, reason, this yeah. right. So right. I don't know if that's from a surface degradation or if there's something deeper going on. Okay. So uh, we have the answer, but yeah, so naively, um, we naively we were hoping to see something like that. I don't think we see that yet. Uh, we're still working through the data. One problem is that these things tend to be um, these things tend to be a little bit sensitive in that you have to put the flake down within about two minutes of exfoliating. So they're not always reproducible, but what seems to be maybe true, it's not quite sure, is that um, the superconducting critical current seems to increase with temperature when the uh, flakes are angled. And we're not quite sure why that is just yet. Um, classically, people have tried such an experiment using ball crystals, usually, or whiskers. And usually there, uh, you have to anneal the crystal to get a good interface. So it's a little bit different in that sense. We don't do any annealing. We just put one on top of the other. And we already recover a very good interface. So um, basically, we're still working on it. Do you think the temperature depends on the momentum conservation? Very cold, you know, it was yeah, we're, finite temperature. Yeah. some wiggle room to momentum conserve. The yeah, so um, it only conserves if this interface is very clean, right? So basically, we're still sort of working out these details. Are there any questions? Any other questions? No? OK, let's start again. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You have everything of yours? Yes. Okay, Thank good. Sorry if I stressed you out at the beginning. No, no, no. Yes.